Good day, ladies and gentlemen. This is Watson Michael from Ceylon Institute of English and Leadership. And once again, we are honored to have Dr. Matthew Hanshaw Wall back with us. Right, so for those who don't know, Dr. Hanshaw, he's a writer, speaker, and consultant on climate change and the road to net zero. Matthew, welcome back. And how are you doing? I'm good, thank you. Uh, it's great to be back on the show. Uh, looking forward Absolutely. to talking again. Absolutely. Right. So, uh, all right. So let me start off with our first question for you, okay? Um, what is the name for you to, what's the reason actually for you to name your second book, Climate Change Kitchen? Yeah, so last time I was on the show, we spoke about my first book, um, which yeah. is called Climate Change and the Road to Net Zero. Um, and I kind of told you it was a, a no-nonsense title. That's what it was about. It's about climate change and how we get to net zero. Um, mm. So my second book is a little bit different. Um, this one's actually a cookbook. Um mm -hmm. But it's all about climate change and it's all about low carbon cooking. Um, okay. So what better a title than climate change kitchen? Um, it does what it says on the tin. I'm a simple man. I need a simple title. <laughs> so it's all about cooking, um, but being aware of your carbon footprint and reducing your carbon footprint um, mm. in your cooking. So um, yeah. It's titled The World's Best Dishes with a Low Carbon okay. Twist. So meat and plant-based, reduced calorie, simple cooking. We're fighting global warming with good food. Mm. Uh, and that's really the message um, uh, uh, that I wanted to convey with the, with, with the title. Wow. All right. Okay. So what, um, what, is the, what is the inspiration, actually, for you to write this book? Yeah, so um, I mean, in inspiration really came out of my my last book that we were discussing mm. last time we spoke, um, and that was yeah. a very serious, data driven, model driven, non fiction, four hundred pages analysis of all things climate, so science, technology, yeah. economics, politics across every sector mm. of the economy, and yeah. coming out of writing that book, um, I realised that actually we already have 80 percent of the uh, technology that we need commercially available and already competitive on price to solve 80 mm. percent of the emission global emissions problem um, mm. so areas of the economy like transportation industry and you know home amenities like heating cooling cooking that can all be solved relatively easy with a simple technical fix, which is mostly already commercially available and is already cost competitive. But the one area where I really struggled in writing that book was agriculture. Um, and that's because uh, agriculture is a little bit different. Um, the emissions aren't necessarily from energy use, they're from different um, functions. Um, and in writing that book, I saw that actually Yes, there are things that can be done within agriculture to reduce the emissions. But if we're going to get towards net zero agriculture, there's also going to have to be a lot of cultural change. And um, you know, cultural change means changing the types of food that we put on our plate. Um, and kind of, you know, that was the 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 inspiration that 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 led to this book. So. After I finished the last book, I actually went vegan. I, I, mean, I don't know if you'd call it vegan. It's part-time wow. vegan. So, so I, I ate vegan wow. on my family three three or four days a week. I, I, are you vegetarian or vegan at all? Okay. Are you? Are you, are you um, well, I, 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 do I have a vegan friend? I don't have a vegan friend, actually. Right? So I have been vegetarian for certain reasons for certain periods but yeah no te technically not right so when you say vegan it reminds me of uh, ufc fighter ned diaz who is a vegan okay 
<laughs> so yeah, it, it's growing as a movement, right? Veganism yeah, it is. or vegetarianism in general. I've never done it before, um, but I saw how important it is for the planet. Uh, and actually, I hadn't mm. realized that before writing the book and looking at the data. But it's it's one of the most important changes that needs to be made is eating mm. less meat. Um, unfortunately, mm. I only lasted as a part time vegan for about six months okay. and I just slipped into my old eating habits. So really, the mm. idea for this book was, you know, can you continue to eat the dishes that you enjoy? Can you continue to mm. eat meat? But can you do it with a much lower carbon footprint? So what yeah. I did was take, I took 70 or 80 of the world's most popular dishes from all over the world. Um, I put the recipes into a model. I added up the calories, the fat, the carbohydrates, the protein, and also the carbon footprint of those mm. recipes. And then I said, well, how do we make them lower carbon? And yeah. most people will tell you that carbon footprint of food is about food miles, you know, how far the ingredients have traveled. Mm how it's packaged, uh, what you use to cook it, um, that all of those combined, as well as waste, only accounts for about 30% of the carbon footprint of, a, of the food that you eat. The other 70% is dictated by the ingredients that you buy. So to give you a very rough idea, you know, a vegetable emits about one kilogram of um, greenhouse gases per kilogram of vegetable that you eat and that's you know mm -hmm. from the the growing the fertilizer the, the picking the processing you're transporting selling it to you it's about one kilogram per kilogram of, of food um, if yeah. you take um, let's say uh, chicken that's maybe mm. three or four kilograms of greenhouse gases per kilogram okay. of chicken so okay. it's three or four times worse than a vegetable but it's not too bad mm take lamb that's about 25 kilograms of co2 per kilogram of mm. lamb beef can be 50 kilograms um, and so the ingredients that you choose have a massive impact on the overall carbon footprint of the dish that you're mm. eating so by following a simple set of rules you know reducing the meat a bit um, you know, avoiding beef and lamb and, and, and choosing mm. something like chicken instead or vegetarian yeah. options, then there are lots of ways of reducing the carbon footprint of your dish. And so, the, you know, there's 70 recipes in here. On average, they have 75 percent lower carbon footprint than the standard oh. recipe for these you know, uh, okay. popular, you know, most popular dishes in the world. They also have 20 percent fewer calories and 40 percent wow. less saturated fat. So actually making these swaps is not only good for the planet, it's also good for you. Mm. Um, and so that was the whole kind of ethos behind uh, writing the book. Mm. All right. OK, interesting. So, mm, all right. So based on that, now what I views on agriculture these days and the road to net zero combining agriculture? Yes. Yeah, so. Um, I think there is progress being made. I, I guess we need to start with why, you know, why, where do the emissions come from in, in agriculture? How big are they? So, you know, yeah. agriculture, the whole sector accounts for about 25 percent of all global emissions. Um, but as oh, I mentioned, you know, so it's big, okay. it's big. Um, and as I mentioned, it, unlike the other areas of the economy where most of the emissions come from energy use, in agriculture, it's a big bit different. So about half of the emissions in agriculture come from changing land use. So the more meat that we eat, the more land that we need for grazing cattle, sheep, for example. And that means deforestation or draining peatland, um, which is a mm. big carbon store. And when you do that, when you cut the trees down, they rot or burn, they release CO2. And it doesn't get reabsorbed because they're not grown back. It's just a little bit of grass mm. for grazing animals. Uh, same with peatland. Mm. So that's about half. The other half of the emissions uh, comes from things like using too much fertilizer, which releases mm. nitrous oxides, which is a greenhouse gas. Um, actually, uh, ruminant burps. So cows and sheep have uh, these stomachs which um, don't fully oxidize um, mm. the food. And so they release mm. methane, which is a greenhouse yeah. gas about 30 times more potent than CO2. 
Um, yeah. And you know, going into this, I thought, well, yeah, that, that can't be. You know, that, that, that's going to be a spec on global emissions. It's actually not. It's actually mm. about four percent of all emissions globally come from cows and sheep burping. That's nearly as big as deforestation. Mm. So that's a huge impact. Um, and then there's other things, a little bit of energy use, things like uh, uh, paddy, dry, uh, rice paddies, um, drying them down. Okay. Um, that releases um, uh, 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 greenhouse gases into the atmosphere. So, mm. you know, you've got all of these emission sources um, and we need to get them to net zero. And, you know, there can be the system changes taking place. So agriculture itself is getting more efficient. Um, so it can produce more food on less land. Um, it's uh, improving uh, on waste. So you know, things like mm -hmm. digital supply chains are reducing the amount of waste that happens in the in the in the food yeah. system. Um, and things like uh, precision agriculture can apply fertilizer a lot more um, specifically using weather forecasts and drones and things like that. So you don't get all of this excess fertilizer runoff. So there is systems change happening. It needs to happen faster. Mm. But you'll never get to net zero in agriculture without cultural change. And so that's avoiding mm. those uh, the you know, the were the most impactful um, areas of agriculture on emissions. Um, yeah. which is, you know, typically um, meat because yeah. um, the the what's it called? The, f the the field to fork efficiency of mm. uh, uh, eating meat is less than 10 percent mm. because it's it, it's just so wasteful. So to give you an idea, agriculture uses about a third of all dry land on Earth, a third mm -hmm. of all of the dry land on Earth. You know, urban areas yeah. only account for about two percent. So agriculture is the main reason that we've already chopped down half of the forests on Earth. Um, mm. And within that, half of the crops grown. Um, so about a third of that land is used for crops. About two thirds is used for grazing animals. The third that's used for crops, half are fed to humans. The other half are fed to animals. So. There's just so much of that agricultural land is wasted on either growing crops for animals or grazing animals. Mm. And as a result of that, all of these trees are being cut down, peatland drained, and yeah. you're getting all sorts of side you know, knock on effects. Um, and to summarize that, you know, a vegan diet uses so a, an average diet, which eats meat. Uh, you require about one football pitch of land to grow and graze everything that you need. Uh, to sustain one human being, football pitch. Mm. For a vegan wow. diet, the equivalent vegan diet, same amount of calories, you only need the penalty box. So if I could click my fingers and say, let's turn everybody on the planet vegan tomorrow, not mm. only would the ongoing emissions from agriculture be reduced by about 75%, but actually mm. you could replant so many trees on the agricultural land that you no longer need is that you that you could draw down into those growing trees um, uh, as much CO2 as humans have put into the atmosphere for all of history. So mm. going vegan or reducing meat consumption, at least, is mm. and I didn't think this was true. But having looked at the numbers, it's absolutely true is one of the most powerful changes you can make in uh, helping uh, fight climate change, basically. So, but, yeah, sorry, absolutely. I've gone on a big, a, a bit of a rant there. But back to your original question, you know, things are changing in agriculture, but we also need to support that um, by mm. changing our diet somewhat. And I think, you know, there's a big movement amongst younger people. Um, mm. You know, my book's aimed at those who perhaps can't quite give up meat like me, but want to mm. do good by the environment. And you can actually do that by choosing your ingredients more carefully. Absolutely. So, yeah, I mean, talking about meat, I reduced my consumption, actually. I reduced my consumption a lot uh, when it comes to meat, actually. So, uh, but uh, I do take, but not as how I used to do in the past. Okay. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So, yeah, because like when you say uh, the world, I mean, the whole, when you say, I mean, the whole population in the world, like, if you look at big, uh, look at the vegan diet i mean 
majority of them would uh, never agree. So, uh, but by cutting down meat, yeah, I mean, we could see some progress because already we can see, right, especially in Australia and Europe and across Norum, they're bringing up plant-based meat products. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, so there's, yeah, there are meat alternatives out there and that's a massive growing industry. So uh, plant-based meat. Um, um, and then further down the line, you may even have cultured meat, which is kind of growing um, re real meat from essentially stem cells in a, a vat. And you grow the different fibers and the different tissues and you structure it around some sort of like seaweed scaffold to make a steak. Um, and that's possible at the moment, um, but it's prohibitively expensive, but it will get cheaper as the growing mediums get cheaper and things mm. like that. Um, yeah, I actually don't use any meat alternatives in the cookbook. Um, wow. It's because I think you can, you know, there's, they're great, um, but also, you know, celebrate the vegetable. Um, yes. Vegetables are a great replacement for meat in themselves and you know we can still use meat uh in our cooking but just use it wisely um you know use less of it use it more for flavor um uh and you know you replace it with you know uh, 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 different vegetables which add amazing mm -hmm. texture and amazing flavor to those dishes so i i have a question for you right now based on that could you give us some tips on recipes some recipes yeah yeah so um uh let me let me have a little flick through the book um so uh, this, uh some that i'm some of the favorites maybe i'll mention them um so um this one is easy scallop risotto um okay so this is 60 percent lower carbon footprint than a traditional sort of wow. white fish risotto uh, and w the main thing that we've done here is we've um, swapped the um, the white fish for scallops because scallops uh, or mollusks in general can be farmed off the coastline um, mm. very sustainably low carbon they also filter and clean the water so they're like mm. a, a real superfood from the sea and a great source of yeah. protein um, so you know, scallops, mussels, clams, um, they're all great at this. Uh, and actually, this is a good uh, risotto recipe because it's an easy risotto. So um, yeah, my background's actually in chemistry. Uh, wow. So I did a, I'm a doctor of chemistry. Um, yeah. And there's a really simple way of, of actually making a risotto and getting that sort of creamy consistency as well as that nutty flavor from the rice mm. without, without that process of ladling in the stock bit after bit. Um, I won't reveal it here, but it's in the cookbook. <laughs> uh, but that's that's a good example of, of a simple ingredient swap that works really, really well. Um, perhaps I'll give you, uh, let's see, another one that I've I've flagged in the book, um, moussaka. Um, so that Greek dish. Um, again, here we're going to use pork or chicken mince instead of lamb or mm. beef because it's a okay. much, much lower carbon footprint switch some of the cream or the cheese that you would usually put in uh, and use an oat milk for the bechamel sauce uh, we oven bake the the eggplant uh, mm. instead of deep or shallow frying it because it's using less oil so remember oil is like concentrated plant matter mm. Um, mm. and the same serving size is 75 percent lower carbon footprint 40 percent fewer calories and 50 percent less saturated fat than a traditional moussaka which is delicious but can leave you very full uh, at the end of the meal and this is perhaps a bit of a lighter option and it's better for the planet yeah right so yeah when you talk about food i love it okay so it makes me hungry at times <laughs> I mean, uh, I'm not going to divulge, divulge my age, but I started cooking since I was 10. Okay, nice. What's your specialty right. dish? Well, I would say it would be a, a bit of a hot and spicy and saucy chicken or pork or even yep. prawns. Yeah. So uh, it's hot and spicy with some sauce in it and, you know, 
I'll, I can uh, I can blow out the recipe here, right? Because I don't yeah, have a yeah, you, Okay, you're gonna have to throw me the recipe after this. Yeah. What, what is it a secret? Is this like your secret recipe, family recipe? No, I'll see. Like uh, to be very frank with you, um, I love I love cooking as a hobby, right? So there were attempts where I made many attempts, but uh, I failed. But I never gave up. I said, look, I'm going to keep trying. I'm going to keep trying. And I did that. And I did that, right? So I always keep trying. So one was which I got on, uh, just I think the BBC recipe, American pancakes. Okay, so I made that again. Uh, yeah, it's pretty good. Okay. But uh, not a big fan of sweets, right? So I love spicy stuff. Okay, spicy yeah. stuff. All right. So, right. So. So I, I will not further talk about certain recipes because you're making me hungry. All right. <laughs> <laughs> we'll move on. We'll move on. All right. So um, what are your top tips for everybody to lower their carbon emissions from their homes? Yeah. So from the, you know, uh, you're reducing carbon emissions when you're cooking at home. Um, Again, in the book, um, we set out sort of uh, seven key principles, if you like, that we that we um, that we use in all the recipes. Um, because mm. you know, whilst it's great people cooking from this cookbook and it's lower carbon, I want them to yeah. take away the ideas and use it in um, other meals that they cook or in what they mm. choose to buy from the supermarket or a restaurant. Mm. Um, and at the same time, you know, hopefully those restaurants and supermarkets and people working in the food supply chain or within um, you know, a cafeteria in your business that you own, whatever it may be, helping them make smarter choices for what they stock and sell. Um, so in our book, um, first off, 800 is the magic number. So all of the recipes in here are less than 800 calories. So that's your recommended intake for a a main meal and they're all less Mm -hmm. than 800 grams of co2 um, which is less than half of the average um, meal today Mm. Um, and obviously the first tip is eat more greens and uh, Mm. less meat so you know switching to more plant-based diet is a surefire way of reducing Mm. your carbon emissions you know and you often get into these debates around uh avocados and almonds and or you know there's this specific plant groups which for whatever reason how they're farmed or where the supply chain works where they couldn't can be sustainability issues you know but you know taking it avocado is the example that usually comes up in the uk even if i f- mm. have a, a an avocado in the uk imported from mexico it's about two gra- uh, two kilograms of CO2 per kilogram of avocado. You know, that's still uh, 20 times better than eating a kilogram of meat, of beef, let's say. So yeah. all of these things are on a relative scale. So uh, and, and we set out you know, the, the all of the footprint of different ingredients in the book. Um, but generally more plant, less meat. Um, choose your meats carefully. So I would try to avoid beef and lamb or have it on special mm. occasions, uh, eat more chicken and pork um, because of uh, there's no direct emissions from the burps mm. and uh, they require less land. So there's less impact on the environment. Uh, fish, um, generally you want to choose fish that swim in big schools. Um, so they're easy to catch and you don't burn lots of fuel trying to catch them. Um, and you always want to go hand line and pole caught. Um, so that the, you know that the fishing method is not um, you know, sort of uh, trawling across the seafloor and, uh, and digging up the seabed and disturbing it um, because that's not good for the environment. It's not good for the ocean. It's not good for climate change. Um, so always go for fish that swim in big schools, are easy to catch. Things like um, uh, herring, uh, mackerel, um, skipjack tuna is pretty good. Um, try to avoid kind of ocean white fish salmon Mm. is tricky it can be good it can be bad it it depends um then i would say in terms of seafood um shellfish go for mollusks 
so we've already spoken mm. scallops clams um mussels avoid crustaceans so prawns crabs lobsters crustaceans tend to be uh the fishing techniques are either harmful or they're grown at the expense of natural ecosystems like mangroves um mm. so it's a safer bet is sustainably farmed uh, mollusks go easy on the oil so a uh you know one tablespoon of oil uh, not only has a lot of emissions but it has a lot of calories um so mm. i tend to use an oil sprayer that's what we recommend in the book okay. because one oh. spray of oil will do cook your food a couple of sprays of oil will be a couple of milliliters of oil rather than a tablespoon which is 15 milliliters and it'll cook your food just as well because it distributes the spray much better so you're saving calories you're saving co2 dairy um try and choose plant-based alternatives like oat milk mm -hmm. we've already discussed instead of um uh, cow's milk for instance um mm -hmm. If you're going to use cheese, use hard cheese for flavor in small amounts. Um, if you're going to use cheese in quantities, try and opt for soft cheeses, which use less milk in their production. Um, and then, yeah, just, just prep your meal. Think about it so you don't mess up the cooking and waste it. And portion control is important, not only for to stop overeating, um so you can maintain a nice healthy weight um yeah but also because you're not wasting food because food waste is obviously um emissions waste um uh which is obviously not good absolutely so now uh, based on your background in chemistry uh right matthew you seem to know a lot when it comes to uh reducing emissions in uh, food waste okay so, I mean, uh, I didn't know about the oil spray, actually, right, until uh, today. Okay, this is the first time I'm hearing about the oil spray, right? That's so, a great tip. I mean, so, they're about, it's about maybe $5. You can pick one up from Amazon or wherever. You just right. fill it from the bottle with oil, spray it, yeah. easy. You'll use less, yes. so you'll save money, you'll save calories, you'll save fat, and you'll save CO2 emissions. Absolutely. So, that's something which I need to speak about to actually with my family and my friends and colleagues that's something which i should uh, tell them right so uh i mean what, from what i understand is that your book will not only help people actually might help even small to medium restaurants and even big hotels actually who want to reduce the emissions and who want to achieve uh, their sustainable targets i mean your book can uh, help them a lot actually yeah right? exactly yeah yeah, so I mean, yeah, I mean, like it's pretty good, right? I mean, Jay, yeah, you're a you're a you're a great guy, Matthew. Actually, yeah, super about that, right? <laughs> great. So, uh, yeah. So, any uh, like uh, any final message uh, you want to give our viewers and listeners who seek motivation? Um, final message. Yeah, I would say, look, um, when it comes to individual action. So, you know, the way I think about action on climate change, you've got governments, you've got mm. companies and corporates, and you've got individuals. Mm. And there's often this argument, you know, who in this triangle is the most important, who is responsible for solving climate change? And the answer yeah. is obviously all three, right? All, all three mm. have to move together if you're going to do, yeah. if you're going to transition an entire economy away from fossil fuels. Um, mm. you know, it absolutely has to be um and i would say to the individual don't underestimate the power of small changes which can make a very big difference um and food is the perfect example of that so making a few small changes to your diet um you know we're talking about being able to transform um uh, and, uh, the agricultural sector, which is responsible for a quarter of all global emissions. Um, mm. uh, and you as an individual can push that change. And it's actually one of the biggest things that you can do within your life, uh, you know, changing your life up um, to help fight climate change. Right. So it's it's as big, if not bigger than you know, driving an electric car 
or switching to a renewable tariff or uh, installing a heat pump to heat your home. Um, you know, it, it's just as big, if not the, the biggest change that you can make. Great. So Matthew, thank you very much for sharing your insightful views and doing this podcast with us. No problem. It's been a pleasure. Thank you for having me. Sure.